since 1st of January of this year. I am uh, what is called retired, still active, still active at the brewery, but retired. So, so uh, now my two sons, Jos and Karl, are running the brewery. Um, I'm, still, I'm still a bit busy with uh, raw material, with uh, wooden cast, the blends, etc. But uh, they, they run the, uh, the brewery. But uh, COVID or uh, Corona concerns, um, a lot of our customers uh, consumed uh, our beers at home. So that uh, finally there was uh, no difference in sales. Uh, we, we sold less uh, kegs to the, the bars that were closed, but we sold more uh, bottles. So finally, at the end of the year, the turnover was uh, the same. And so um, no problems with, uh, with that. Um, and at this moment, as, uh, as I told before, my sons are in charge and they created uh, a shop at the brewery because it was impossible to buy beers at our brewery before. And now they will open um, November 15, I think, um, a bar. It will be called Boon Bar, or Bone Bar, as we pronounce it. And then uh, at the, the second floor, uh, another part of the bar, but which can be used for brewery visits. And, uh, and so it will be uh, possible for groups to visit the brewery and taste uh, all our beers locally and take some uh, bottles at, uh, at home. And you've built up such an amazing uh, uh, producer, uh, supplying a lot of blenders and other things. What's it feel like to pass on your legacy? Well, um, I'm, I'm very happy that it is possible. When I uh, moved to the spot where the brewery is now in 1982, it was my idea to live at the brewery. Say, if I have children, and they grow up in the brewery, uh, the chance that they will um, be interested in the brewery and work in the brewery is, will be higher. And that's what happened. So when my sons were, uh, say, seven, eight years old, and they came from school, and they ran into the brewery, and then uh, made um, little drawings from the machines that were there, tried to make these machines in cardboard at home, and then uh, when they bought Playmobil, uh, they wanted uh, lift trucks in Playmobil and little little beer crates and, and things like that. So, so finally, I am very happy that uh, when they grew up, they wanted to study um, the, the, the studies you have to do to, to be a good brewer. So my son, uh, Jos, is a brewing engineer from Louvain University, and Carol, he studied uh, economics. So they understand each other very well and they, they are absolutely uh, able to run the brewery for the next who knows, 20 or 30 years. What do you consider, and you've done so much, uh, is your legacy, even though you're semi-retired and you're still working and you're still an ambassador for, for the style uh, and the Belgian culture, what do you consider you know, your legacy, what you're proud of to say about yeah. Well, the, the existence or the survival of uh, what is called uh, mellow, soft, malsalambic. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, when I started, a lot of breweries closed every year, and most of these lambics were oxidized, uh, overaged, uh, extremely acid sometimes. Uh, a lot of producers had problems with acetic acid uh, in infections in their, in their stocks, and it was the end of Gers and Lambic because the blends they made, they had to make it with beers that finally were not so perfect. So, so I was able to, uh, to buy the last blendery in Lambic of Mr. David, and he was extremely, uh, extremely carefully for his beer. So all Gers de Witt were uh, soft, mellow, fantastic, uh, nice bottles. His only problem was that he only produced 200 hectoliters a year and uh, he was uh, living with his sister, both unmarried, shop, brewery, blendery, uh, and the equipment was uh, extremely old. But this was the start and uh, the difficult thing was to to make this brewery 
um, grow because it has to be profitable. If you lose money, okay, uh, it's the end of the brewery. So, so it needed a certain size. It was po possible for me to reach that uh, size and and to preserve the quality uh, from Mr. De Witt's, uh, the, the quality he made until 1975-76. You see, so today we, we have a lot of stock of uh, very uh, soft, mellow, fine, delicate, uh, lambic. It allows us to make any goes. Yeah? If I want to blend in some ascetic, uh, yeah, if some customers ask me, can you make some more ascetic goes, it's no problem. It's always easier to add more acidic uh, lambic to soft than to make soft uh, uh, goes if all your lambic turns into vinegar. Eh? You see? So that is, that is the most important thing. That is why a goes bone uh, is 60% of the sales of traditional goes in Belgium eh? from the total market. Eh? Amazing. Where do you see? Is it a bright future for lambic? Going forward, given uh, I don't know because I'm not involved. I I I, I, I won't be involved. The question it depends on uh, the future from the of the brewers or the blenders that produce it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, new blenders and brewers that will be will be on the market in the coming years. The question will be: Will this be fantastic beer or not? Uh, I hope it is because it's the the total image of the of the market. You see, so that is very important. If you go to a wine country, and all wines are fantastic, then you you go back and you say this is. If you go to that country, wow, fantastic wines. If you go there and by accident. Uh, you you drink one that is undrinkable. Uh, you think the whole country is like that. So it will be important to keep lambic and and goose and the, the lambic the fruit beers made from lambic at a, a very good quality level. That will be a, a very important target, I think. Is is that is that currently is that currently the situation? Is it at a high level? Do you consider, or can it? Reach yes, but there is still still uh, it's it's difficult to talk about uh, my beer and beer from my colleagues. So I think you have to taste them. Um, but I think there is uh, always room for for improvement. Huh? But the quality we reach at our brewery today. It was impossible to produce that level 30, 40 years ago, just because of equipment and also uh, partly because the knowledge we have today was not available 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, and I could see because uh, although, of course, we weren't allowed in, you have science labs, you're very much on the cutting edge of, of innovation. Yes, uh, I, I just give you one example. Imagine uh, in a brewery you want to make top quality beer. The first things you look at is raw materials. Eh? Uh, if your brewery is at a, a good size or uh, at a certain size, it is possible to buy a certain variety of barley and ask to the maltster, can you make a batch for me with that barley and you malt it that way? That is the soaking at, at that degree, germination, at that temperature, so many days, and then you, you, you go to the kiln, that temperature, everything. You can, you can order and, and ask your malter to make your malt on specification. In our case, one batch is 60 tons of barley, makes 50 tons of malt. And then your malt is exactly the malt you want for that type of beer. If the brewery is too small, then it is aloe malt, and they will sell you sell sell you some pilsner malt, maybe not, uh, maybe probably malt that is okay, but maybe not the malt you want for lambic. So that is that is the an improvement we were possible to make at our brewery when the brewery grow when we we came at the level we we have today. So it will be important for a lot of producers to reach levels uh, that help them to. To, uh, to have the right raw materials and to, to make the, the fantastic beer with them. Uh, in 1975, uh, his, his goal was actually to take over a blender here in, in Lembeek 
blender who used to blend lembics, make his geuze. And actually people from even the other side of Brussels came all the way here to Lembic because they knew like this was one of the best bottles of goods you could find at this guy's place and uh, the man was going to retire didn't have any successors and so my father knew him because well through a few friends he actually knew him uh, my father used to live north of brussels and then uh, later only moved here but he already knew uh, mr de witz so he was his predecessor uh, and um, it's actually by uh, going back to the witz and then hearing like look uh, i have no predecessors my father having the interest actually to oh but maybe I want to do this later uh, and then one thing led to another my father came to an agreement that he could take over that uh, he, the blendery so my father started in 1975 and then two almost three years later he was able to take over the blendery that's uh, five minutes from where we are today uh, we still have the old facility the old brewery uh, and uh, then uh, one thing led to another even later moved to this location in the center of Lembeek to expand because there was demand and there was he wanted to start brewing as well so in 1990 my father built a brew house from all second-hand material that he could find uh, all over the place in belgium really uh, from old breweries um, and then yeah that's where we are today so that's my father started the brewery and then uh, today my brother and myself have taken over the brewery so we run the brewery today uh, my father who you just saw actually uh, passing by here um, my father he's actually uh, still uh, running the cooperage because we have to maintain all our wooden casks and so on so he's still running the cooperage and passing this on and uh, guiding us with everything that's considered blending and so on and he's still doing r d around around the beer but that's things i think he's still gonna do even after for a long time <laughs> when we're uh, when we're here and he's still at home uh, so my father literally started from scratch so he you gotta, you gotta imagine 1975 he started with zero right uh, so the, zero, the figure was zero. Um, he started with blending, uh, you know, with some some casks that only a few t ten liters each, uh, twelve liters each, these kind of things. But then when he uh, took over the uh, the Witzes, uh, facility, their yearly production was about two hundred and fifty hectoliters. Today we have casks that contain the same quantity, and we have uh, today our production is about two, twenty thousand hectoliters. So that's uh, quite a bit more. <laughs> Um, but only in the last, I would say, 10 years, this really started growing. Um, in 2000, maybe we were at uh, three, 4,000 hectoliters. Now, yeah, it's, it's been growing. And uh, the last years, people have shown more and more interest in, in lambic beers and spontaneously fermented beers, especially in Geuze, traditional Geuze. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's been growing. Um, so now it's 20,000 hectoliters. So that's not the biggest brewery in the world, so definitely not. But also not a small one. They're like, they're like the, the, the bigger one between the smaller ones. <laughs> I would say about 30% 30, 30 is export. So 70% of what we do is all uh, for Belgium and mostly the region here, uh, Brussels and then some the bigger cities in Belgium. And what are you going to show us today? I'll show you uh, the whole brewery. <laughs> Alright, let's go! <laughs> So this was all built with uh, second-hand material back in the day. Only the, the cool ship was the only, the only new equipment uh, back then. So the cool ship is here right on top of you. Uh, you can actually see it if you go up the stairs here. And the cool ship, of course, we still use. Uh, the, the brewery here, the brewery house, we built a new one in uh, 2012. Uh, became operation in, operational in 2013. And... Uh, the last brew in this brew house was made in uh, March 2013 and then we made the switch to the new one. Uh, but of course we kept the cool ship, this is being used, uh, well, every day when we're brewing, so, for each brew. So are you, uh, is it still a cool ship season? Yes? Yes, of course. Uh, we actually, we started brewing uh, a couple of weeks ago now, uh, two, two weeks ago. And so, when the beer's cooling down on the cool ship, the most important thing is, well, not necessarily cooling down. It's called a cool ship, but it's the most important thing is catching the, the wild yeast. So yeah. in that case, we would open the windows. Oh, you open the windows here. Then we start a ventilator over there. We, get, we create an air current that way, pull in the, the, the air from outside, as well as all the, the fantastic wild, uh, <laughs> wild yeast and, and so on. And that's actually how, how, it, how it's, well, after the brew, how it starts fermenting. The brewing, of course, is, is, is a whole other process as well. Yeah, it's yeah. not to be underestimated. It's no. not just... Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, I'll show the brew house uh, just in a bit. But this is just to show you a little bit where, where my father started as well uh, in 1990 then. So this used to be an old, the, the, the building series used to be some old factory that my fa father was able to buy uh, back in, uh, in 1982. Um, but there was really nothing here. These were all very, all open buildings without walls in them. So he actually had to build everything uh, really uh, by himself with the help of friends and so on. Um, so yeah, you can imagine that <laughs> when this was here. Yeah. That was a, a big a big advantage. And back then also you have to know that 1990, you could only start a brewery if you could brew 20 hectoliters or more. So, oh. so you couldn't, it was not allowed to make a smaller brew house. That was illegal. So you can imagine today people brewing in their garage. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's normal, but back then it was illegal. So it was, I think only after 19... 93 I'm not sure that's great but I think somewhere there you had it was allowed to to you to brew with a smaller brew houses but he, so he built one this was fi this is a 50 hectoliter brew house yeah. and then behind the the wall there you have the old old uh, boiling uh, boiling uh, kettles mm -hmm. which are which are copper but it's all yeah so this is uh, um, what do you call it uh, Heat, heat as a cast iron, there you go. <laughs> and so uh, that's that's all equipment. And this was good for, you know, starting up the brewery. <laughs> but at a certain point, the, 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 and this is, this is a nice romantic view of Lambic, <laughs> but it is important to understand that uh, for a brewer, uh, this brew house is, is good to get to a certain quality, but you're always uh, facing certain limits where you're saying okay I want to achieve this quality and I, I want to uh, improve this taste in this direction but you just can't because you're limited by the installation that you have so also when you're using cast iron for example a, a simple example is simply like you taste mi minerality in yeah, the beer yeah. that's actually the iron that you're tasting yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? right and it, cast iron exactly cast iron will, uh, if you're using copper installations copper helps to oxidize your beers it's, it's all these kinds of things that that are actually, uh, in the end, not fantastic for the beer. And so we have today uh, uh, well, inox, steel. Uh, stainless steel. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually a very good material to build installations for brewing. It doesn't look as romantic as cast iron uh, mesh tons with a uh, nice red paint on it and so on. But it, it, is, uh, it is much better to get the quality and the consistency of the brews, brews uh, and the whole, actually the whole production um, in the end. And that's, like, uh, that's always been the focus as well. I mean, we've, we've always been focusing on putting the quality of the beer first. Um, when my father started, I think that was the, probably the, the main thing was we need to have this quality. He was the first one, the first person to also ask well, within that period of, of, of the of Lambic beer history to actually ask more money for a bottle of beer because he knew that otherwise it would not be possible to live of it and secondly invest in it. Uh, all other Islamic brewers were like, you're crazy. <laughs> Why would you ask more money for it? And now look at where it is now. Yes, exactly. And still we're not asking uh, if you compare it to today's uh, prices that you sometimes see, we're, we're very reasonably priced within Islamic beer. But of course it's still, as a beer, it's still more expensive beer. So it's, but it is more expensive to make. Well, my, when my father took over the Vitz, my father recuperated like the casks. Some casks still had Lambic. Most were actually empty at, uh, because the, 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 the man actually stopped buying new Lambic for a while before he retired and then emptied his casks. I think he only had like 12 left with, with beer. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's... And I heard your father from the, I think it was your father who donated a lot of historical materials to the museum. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Not materials and information and, and knowledge. If you talk, I've talked to my father about the history of Lambic, uh, not only about the technical, technical aspects of brewing the beer and blending and, and, aging, and so on and so forth, also the history. Yeah, he, in, the re in the beer world, he's known as a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> and there's good reason why he's often called that. <laughs> So we donated a lot of material and you know even even when today still uh i can't actually mention <laughs> from who but we bought some uh, in, in some old installation brewing equipment uh, recently of, of someone else uh, a lambic brewer uh, but he actually was replacing it with something newer and he was gonna just take it apart scrap it and throw it out and we we're like how much do you ask for it <laughs> okay we'll buy it from you and we just stuck it here because we don't want the history of the installation to go you know, yeah. it's it's like if you look at the it's 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 a it's a 
it's a it's not a it's a boiling vessel and if you look at it you just see like oh it has history and and then that's what you want to preserve not for brewing necessarily but more of the, the for the historic value okay. maybe at some point we'll do something with that more in a more public way as well but uh so we're keeping like we have we have old brewing installations uh we have we actually have an old brew house stored somewhere in, in like in the old brew house my the old blender that my father took over from mr devitz back in the time we actually have an old brewery there the, the, the part of the installation from van der linde brewery which was an old brewery here in Halle, which uh stopped in early 2000 but we also bought that just to like save it the brewery buildings are demolished and it's apartments now just like what happens so often these days when in the, in the 70s there was still quite a few around i mean there were still blenders around more blenders around there were more brewers but you had uh, van den stock buying most of the brewers in the region uh, many many brewers in the region um had blenders but they were all just doing the same thing like Mr. what the Witz was doing they were like okay there's no future in this beer they didn't see there was a f possible future and they said okay let's just finish what we have and uh, close the place and then sell sell it for the price of the building perhaps and, and, and whatever anyone wants to give for anything. And that used to be the case for a lot of, of blenders and brewers and I, uh, I think in 1990 there was the only traditional lambic beers that you could find were probably from uh, well from my father, so from, from Boden, from us, then uh, Cantillon in Brussels, from Girardin, Timbermans was still making a traditional uh, Goethe, I think that was it. So that's only four produ producers making traditional Goethe in 1990. But that's a bit of a, like a really a low point. And then I, th in just a little bit later, only a little bit later, there are some people starting again and or, or or deciding to continue anyway, despite having chosen before to to maybe stop their their business. Um, so yeah, it was a. A, a, a difficult time back then, but today, as I said, like 10 years ago, we really saw everything picking up where it was really going down before. Yeah. Right. Just to give you some context, so what you see here is uh, our main production hall. Um, so when we built our new brewery, brew house, in 2013, we added this big building, which is like a small, a sort of a, a big Lego box for us, right? We can, we added actually three years ago these floors because we needed them. So it's like one big room where we can just add stuff, change stuff along the way when, what, with whatever, for whatever is needed. Like if we have, need more capacity for fermenting cherries, we can add that. That's actually what we're doing uh, right now behind the wall <laughs> there. Um, what we mainly put in here were these three tanks, these are water tanks. So we have a w w warm water, cold water tank, and in the middle, it's what we call our battery. Basically, when we're, let's say, boiling beer, for example, you create a lot of vapors. Instead of letting all that escape, we recuperate this and do, let it go through a heat exchanger. And then it actually gets in contact with a closed water system, which is from the battery, where the water is being heated up from, with that energy, with that vapor that's being condensed. And then you actually save all this heat into the closed system of the battery. And then we actually be, are able to save up to 70% uh, of uh, fuel to make steam, which is a big saving just in, and you know, if you need to make the same amount of beer with old brewers or a new one, it's 70%. And so now we're making maybe double the amount that we used to make with the old brew house. We, we're still not using the same amount of fuel to make steam. So that's a, uh, been a big, uh, a big uh, saving, which is good because it's ecological and also economical. And then, of course, that's the beauty of sustainability. exactly, and that's what we're often trying to achieve. You, uh, you'll, it's not always easy to notice because you don't know, um, but a lot of the things that you see also, like simple things, like you know, just as railing, for example, it's possible. That, well, this one is what you also knew when we installed it, but uh, the railings over there can just say that these were recuperated from other parts in the brewery. If we install something we just see like we have some uh, we have spare stairs cases we have spare staircases uh, lying around we have spare uh, mat building materials lying around just to if we, if we demolish something we'll try to recuperate as much as possible it's not just a philosophy within the within uh, within uh, being uh, uh, 
ergonomical and 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 let's say economical within beer brewing in a, in, a, in a, not in a way that it would uh, deteriorate your quality um, it's just a way of like trying to be efficient and and, and using materials and and, and being, being durable within that you know? so it's a bit of a bit of a typical thing as well we do here and then um, yeah quite important so these are when we make our fruit beers that's all like our creek creek bone creek mariage parfait and so on also our raspberry beer framboise bone uh, we use real fruit so we don't add concentrated uh, juices we will use fresh fruit um, which we will by the way store in the f it's, a, it's like a, a cooling cell at minus 21 degrees celsius there behind that wall um, and we actually have these two uh, tanks beneath here those are the ones we use for fermenting our cherries so we will add cherries in that we will add one year old lambic and it will ferment together for a few weeks and then we would, that's what we have is a creek lambic cherry lambic which is the basis for all our cherry beers we can do that with different types of cherries if you want and so on so it's uh, quite flexible but you're actually now improving this system so these are just open tanks but it's still a bit uh, primitive in the sense that it used, well, well, when, when you're emptying it, the, the beer just flows out in open air. Of course, that's picking up oxygen, and so you get oxidation. It's limited, but it's always better to avoid it as much as possible. So right now we're installing something new behind the wall. It's a bit of an invention, so it's behind the wall. <laughs> and it's underneath our cooling cell, so we can actually just pull in fresh cherries from over there, because we're in a, in a hill here, so we actually have the ground floor again over there. When it's being delivered, cherries are delivered here, put into the freezing cell, we'll, we'll go in there in a second. And then from in the cell, we can take out the pallets with cherries again, through a hole in the floor, dump them in the fermentation vessel, and then the fermentation goes for a week or two or three, if, depending on what we're trying to achieve on the cherries and so on. Um, so yeah, that's for cherries. I'll show that in a bit. We'll go first go to the brew house. Uh, sorting with uh, getting a uh, supplier or mm, no no we actually buy uh it, it depends right so if, if you would say like look let's try to make all our fruit beers all our all our all our creek with uh scar baked cherries for example that's not just not possible we use uh, about 300 tons of cherries per year wow. 300 tons of cherries but if you uh, know that there is only like the harvest of Scharbeek's cherries yearly is about let's say 15 20 tons so where do we get our cherries then we found my father found a, a, a variety of uh, of cherries that's very close to the Scharbeek's cherries in southern Poland and this is where our cherries are currently being uh, being harvested and so the biggest part comes from there and then we still buy some Scharbeek's as well now every year but it's not enough to do the whole production. So we get some from Poland and then, well, that's the biggest part and a small part for special Schaar makes a cake each year as well. Okay. Yeah. And then everything else, which is malt, uh, uh, wheat, uh, hops and so on, then th that's, that we can find in, that we can find plenty normally. But of course it's finding the right, uh, the right type, but uh, that, that's not always made necessarily easy. <laughs> and what's your background then? My background, uh, yeah. So, uh, huh, it's a bit of a, a bit of everything, maybe in a way. Uh, so I grew up right there. <laughs> that's my background, I would say. Uh, literally, that's, I grew up in the house right there. And uh, as a kid, we always drove around here with our bikes. We played in the brewery and, and outside the brewery. So that's a bit of like how how it's always been a part of our life. Um, but then for my, my studies were, had nothing to do with beer. My studies were uh, applied economic sciences. Uh, that's also why I, I do more the, more the business side of the brewery. My brother is a bioengineer, uh, specialized in brewing and malting, and he does everything that's the whole production. He runs the whole production, uh, follows up qual on, on, on quality, runs the labs here. So that's uh, what my brother does. That way, we're, we're, that way we're combining a bit of our own interests, personal interests, to get everything done in the brewery. But that being said, uh, the background is not just that, it's of course also our, fa our father who is always like l teaching us things like daily. So it's, uh, that's a big thing of, <laughs> of our background as well. Yeah. So this is obviously a new brew house. So it's actually uh, also for a part still made with secondhand material, but it's been actually designed by my father and my brother. 
um, to make Lambic beer. So it's the only uh, Lambic brew house that exists that's fully automated to make Lambic beer. Um, so it is one, one's fully automatic. Uh, in a normal brewing week, my, my brother would start up the brew house in, on, a, on Sunday uh, from even at home. So he's able to connect to the brew house with his computer, um, even with a smartphone if you want, it's possible. Um, and then he starts up the, the brewery, the, start, the, the, um, the preparations for brewing will start and then by 10 o'clock in the evening on a Sunday the first brewer arrives. So we have about five people that we educated as a brewer here at the brewery. Um, but the first brewer would arrive, he would brew through the night and then we will continue in the morning and we will brew just 24 hours a day until uh, Friday at noon. And that way we brew about um, three, three brews, no, four brews a day, sorry. Four brews a day um, for about four days. Uh, one brew is 125 hectos, so we're doing 500 hectos in one day. So let's say for four days in a week, we're at 2,000 hectoliters that we brew in one week. Because by doing this continuous way of, of brewing, we can recuperate heat from the previous brew to heat up other things for the next brew. Um, that way we don't have to clean everything in between. We just do the cleaning at the end of the week. It's easy, it's a simple way of, of it helps in, and it's, it's also, where, again, uh, means they don't have to use uh, cleaning, cleaning products uh, all the time. It's, it's, well, you know, it's uh, better, better to continue what you're doing when you're, once you're brewing. Um, and by running this, con in doing this in this continuous way, that's why we have so many um, uh, kettles, just to be able to go do all the separate steps. So basically we start mashing over there in the two filtration vessels there. And then we move up all the way here. We have that vessel over there, which is for um, the turbid mesh method. So when we're brewing, you'll p separate part of the brew, but it will go over here, uh, which is to, in the end, the, the point is to get, create very complex sugars for the wild yeasts to uh, transform. Um, so that's where you use the turbid mesh method for Lambic. After that, that's being put together again and goes to our boiler here. Then we have a spare boiler there, and this actually is for making top fermented beer. We don't we make one top fermented beer under our own brand, and sometimes we make it for some other people as well. Sometimes we do things that combine top fermented beer and lambic beer in one. Uh, we don't have that in our own brand, but it exists. Uh, so these are some very strange beers, but they exist. <laughs> and now with the COVID, is your storage space enough that you can keep oh. brewing? Yeah, we actually, there's a funny thing with Lambic breweries, it's affected of course when you're not selling the beer, you're just aging beer and it's not necessarily bad for the beer, which is a good thing, um, but it means that today our Eau de Geuse actually contains about 30 to 40 percent um, three-year-old Lambic, which that's the case today, uh, while normally it would be more 20 percent, maybe 15 even. Um, but actually it's, it's pretty nice for the beer to have so much old Lambic in there. But it's, it's a way you, you're able to manage the stock that you have in casks. We have 2.1 million liters, so that's 21,000 hectoliters of Lambic in oak casks. And because of the fact that you have so, many, so much stock, well, there's a bit of a buffer, you know, you can just you play a bit with your blends, add some more old Lambic, add a little bit less old Lambic. If there's a lot of demand, you can do that. Um, but moral lambic is also nice. So in a way, it's a, it's a bit of a strange thing, uh, of course. So the blends are a bit different. That way we can manage our stocks. Um, but if there's more demand, just, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a fun thing. Uh, but, uh, um, but it's a nice thing as well for the, for the, for the good to suddenly have more old, uh, old lambic. So it's a bit of a double feeling. <laughs> Yeah, we, we try to keep it in the same direction, but it gets just adds the three-year-old adds more character, and it's 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 yeah. If you get a lot of uh, young lambic, it also adds uh, character in its own way. It makes makes it perhaps a little softer. Um, it helps with uh, foam stability and so on as well. Um, but it's all these yeah. It's it's their small changes, and if you if I tell you like these two blends are different, you'll know. But if you're not paying attention, most people just not right will not really uh, realize it as much because we're trying to blend, of course, always trying to keep the same. If we're making out of here's a bun, we try to get a certain taste. So even if we're adding more old out of here's, we're trying to see, okay, how can we blend it so that it's still 
going this direction. Yeah, exactly. So if we're making gyros mariage parfait, in that case, when we're tasting lambics from our, from our fooders, we have about 40 variables that we're keeping track of. A lot of, one, a lot of them are, are the ones that we're tasting. A lot of them are also variables which are just objective th uh, values from our lab. Uh, so we will taste samples from the, from the casks, and then the day after we will analyze those samples as well in the lab. Um, that way we have a nice view on, on, on all the characteristics from each lambic uh, cask. But uh, one variable is also a simple one. It's, is this mariage, mariage parfait? Yes or no? It's like a taste, you know, it's something we're after. It's something like small, uh, something smoky, something like whiskey-like, you know, and then, but still some, some wine uh, touches there, a bit of oak, not too much. And then those are the, 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 the that's okay. Let's go for mariage parfait. Yes. And then after a while, you know, um, all our casks have been in use for quite a, lot, quite, quite a long time and we know which ones are actually always going to give which taste. You, with the brewing consistent lambic, you get consistent results also when aging and then you know you can rely on your casks giving a certain taste. In between you'll notice differences, but you'll notice that this one, okay, next year it will evolve into this. You taste it now, you know, okay, it will go in this direction. That's, that's uh, also an advantage of being consistent, but then you know, uh, Okay, we can ma make mariage parfait, we can plan to make about this much, we'll have these casks, and when you taste it, you're like, okay, yes, that's mariage parfait. <laughs> and then again, the same for other, other blends, if you want to make other things, it's, uh, it's a bit how, it, how, how we do our, our, our thing. Yeah, yeah. Is that your most popular, would you say? The mariage parfait? Uh, perhaps, maybe abroad, uh, but in Belgium, you know, most of what we're selling is out of here's a bone. That is, uh, out of here's a bone is about 5,000 hectoliters. All our goods together is uh, sh just shy of 9,000 hectoliters. And it's just traditional goods. Yeah. But uh, yeah, goods mariage parfait is like the, sec the second most popular goods that we have, of course. It's, <laughs> uh, it's well yeah, 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 it's well known. It's a, it's, an, it's a fun name, a well known name, but also a good name. It uh, it's, it's, uh, has some history as well in, in the fact that the mari mariage refers to a good blend, right? It's a marriage. Like you have in wine, you have a mariage and you have coupage. Coupage would be, let's take all your misery beer, which we don't have, so we don't have a coupage, we have good beer. <laughs> but in, 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 in historical terms, you have coupage, which is like, take all your misery wine or in wineries or misery beer and all in blenderies or in a brewery, blend that together to make something nice and drinkable, but take your best beer to make it a mariage. And my, that's also my, when my father started, he was the first not only to raise his price of a goza, it was the, actually the, the price of a goza that he raised was for his mariage and he called it his mariage parfait, the perfect marriage. And that was his more expensive bottle, but he said, look, this is my better bottle of goza. So if you liked it, then of course you're going to pay a bit more for it, which people did because it was just good beer. And it's still, the, it's still a mariage parfait, it's still a, today a selection of the best casks, of course, also with a certain uh, taste profile in our, in our heads because to be honest, between all the casks, they're all giving fantastic lambic today. There's no misery beer, luckily. Uh, if, if it would be the case, then it would be no, we would not use the cask anymore. It's, uh, we know very well what we're doing. Uh, we take a, quite of a scientific approach maybe on the beer for this, but uh, yeah. It's interesting that you have a lab, not many... Uh, we have two labs. We yeah. have two labs. Yeah. So you're basing on a lot of science, not a lot of brewers even have a lot of <laughs> It's... Uh, it's a bit of a philosophy question, maybe, in a way. Um, it's science, of course. Brewing beer is science. It's quite simple. If you say it's not a science, then you're, you're going to pray to God that things will happen as they happen. But in the end, it's all about science. If you do A and B happens, there is a reaction and there's a reason to this reaction. And that is just science. And you have to figure out why this happens. And everything we do here with Lambic beer, we know we are at the edge of what is known technically within Lambic beer. There's no other breweries at this, at this point. There's not even other labs in the world that we know of, at least, that are at this point in knowledge about certain things. We don't know everything about beer either. I mean, just, but for Lambic beer specifically, I mean, um, certainly when it comes to wild yeasts and so on, we know things that even are not known maybe to some universities simply because they're not working on this. But because we need to know this, we will dig into this, we will dig deeper. That's why also my father will definitely still continue 
everything that's considered R&D here at the brewery. We buy malt to our own specification. That's also a one important thing. So I can show it here actually in a way. Uh, we have our own our silos for malt and, and wheat. So these are the silos. As you can hear, they're full because <laughs> uh, the brewing season started. <laughs> Uh, and so, cool malt. yeah, malt. So these are uh, six silos of uh, 28 tons uh, content. In total. In total. Oh, no, each, each, yes. each is six tons, yes. Six. Uh, each, no, sorry, each is 28 tons and we have six. Sorry. Right. <laughs> um, and we buy our malt to our own specification. Why is that? Simply because, well, if you make a beer, you try to make, try to get the best raw materials as a start, because it all starts there. It already starts with the soil in which it grows. Uh, but we we go find, look for um, uh, the right uh, uh, grains for for malt. We will test uh, malt that is made to our own specification in our in our lab in the start of the in before buying the actual malt, because of course you have to make sure that it's correct, that it has the correct properties. But when getting malt, um, we will buy it for a f with a full truck. Uh, so that's why we have uh, silos. A full truck will be able to unload its malt here. And by buying a full truck, we can actually ask the malter to make it to our specifications. So what we call Lambic malt here. Um, we're not buying standard malt for this. And this is an, another, another thing just that, that our new brew house has permitted us to do was to fine tune our malt because we have consistency in brewing and we, when we have that small, small things, we know that the changes we have made are the, re, the, the, the changes that we taste. There's no other variables influencing things that, that we don't know about. For us, the question to getting to this scale that we have today, this, 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 this challenge, let's say really, uh, was not to because we wanted to make a lot of beer. The, the point is that we would just want to make the best possible Lambic beers and you need the skill for that. So that's also the reason why why we're doing the way we do it today, just to get the best possible beer, and not to make a, not necessarily the point of making a lot of beer. A lot of beer is fun. It's nice to say like, hey, I own two million liters of lambic, <laughs> but that's not the point. The point is that we have a uh, fantastic lambic, and so the scale we're working at is, is to actually achieve that goal. These are Belgian, yeah. These are Belgian. Yeah. So you can see we have. Wow. A nice quantity here. And then we have uh, Danish cherries over there. In the, the gray boxes are Danish cherries. This is for another collaboration with uh, Mikkeler, actually. Oh, Mikkeler. Yeah. So we always made goods with them, but uh, now we may have something with cherries uh, in the pipeline. But we still have to look at a few details first before we get it all confirmed, but uh, that's something. And these are the Polish cherries, which we actually generally use for our, most of our cake uh, in general. And yeah. how long can you keep this here? Well, it's minus 21 degrees Celsius. You can keep them a year if you want, so oh, it's, nice. uh, it's no problem. But this rotates much quicker, of course. But it's a good way to have a buffer. And our logistics is over there. So order picking and these kind of okay, things for... Yeah. And as you can see, you will see that often here, but that's oh. uh, cherry pits, of course. So wow. the, pit, the cherries will ferment with uh, the pits and everything. So after that's all done, you have this left. This is warehouse number one <laughs> of, wow. of four. Um, we have 161 fooders, so fooders are the big ones, and that's uh, 221,000 hectoliters of lambic in fooders. Uh, where do they come from? Most of the fooders, um, we actually did a count recently, 61 of the casks that we have, of the fooders that we have, date before 1914. So like for example, all the ones on top there, it's all casks from before World War I. If you just want to have an idea of how old they are. And they're all beer casks, all lambic casks. So those, that's what we actually, those are the type that we would easily use for mariage perfect, for example. Because those are, those are the ones that actually give us uh, the best lambic, the oldest ones generally, and uh, the ones that have been used for lambic the longest. The ones behind me here are Calvados casks, um, the whole, whole row and the ones on top. They were used in uh, Normandy for Calvados, uh, distilled cider. And um, yeah, we've been using these since 2005. Today they're giving good lambic, but they're still, they used to be until like s the first 10 years, 15 years you get, you still had a few uh, typ typical ones, like I don't know what these things in English, but uh, Gens Jan Wortel, so a little bit uh, uh, the taste of yeah, Gens Jan Wortel. Oh. 
Uh, no, not oak. Gentian wortel is like, uh, oh, I don't know what uh, the English term of that for that would be. Can the machine is Google? But that's uh, just a thing, uh, just one example. There's, there's things that you can, that, that it takes time, but the, the most important thing with a cask and the reason why we use them, because some say, why don't you just use stainless steel? Ha. Well, the, the thing is we need the microflora in the cask. And this is formed not quickly, it takes time. So the first time you use a cask, there will be no microflora for a lambic. Maybe there's a, it was a wine cask and you will get a nice uh, effect from the wine. This is interesting as well, but for making just consistency and getting creating goes and creating what, what we want to create at least, we want the microflora. So basically when you add lambic in there, that comes from the cool ship. So after brewing, you have the cool ship and then after the night you will have the beer coming from the cool ship. It will bring in the wild yeast and the wild yeast together with the beer will go also into the staves, inside these staves. And so also when you're emptying the cask and filling it again, you still have the wild yeast in the, in the staves. And these wild yeast, uh, by doing this over and over and over again for many years, you create a microflora that actually helps with aging the beer. So in the first 10 days of the beer being in the cask, you get fermentation, you get foam being thrown out, yeast being thrown out, um, and then it settles down, and then we go into the maturation, the aging. And after like, let's say half a year, you get interaction, a good interaction between the microflora of the cask itself and the, uh, the lambic inside. And then of course we age up to three years, one, two and three years. Uh, sometimes even, f we actually did it recently until four. It's actually quite exceptional, but it was a small test, which actually went well. Um, but generally it's one, two and three years that we age in the casks and then uh, you have the interaction with the wild yeast. But this is what we need. If you don't have this, you create hard taste, like very harsh, harsh tastes. If you just do stainless steel. Um, if you use new oak, obviously you get too much bitterness from the oak. It, what we try to achieve is what we call malse lambic, soft or let's say mellow lambic. That's what we want to have. So it's not, uh, it's also not a fan of, of, of calling our beer sour beer. Sour beer is, it, it somewhat indicates perhaps like, okay, there is a sour touch to this, but it's not the point of the beer. If lambic is sour, if it's like acidic or really just hurts your cheekbones, like this is actually not okay because it's, you want to be able to drink a whole glass, finish that and say, ah, fantastic, let me have another one. That should be a thing. And then and you have this soft acidity like white wine in Goethe. That's very nice. And that's what we try to achieve. And then Malsa, this is round as a texture, like, you know, it's, it's, that was, that's what we want to have. So that's why we have casks and why the microflora is important because the microflora will help to achieve this mellow Malsa uh, taste. And then between all the casks, it's a bit of the fun thing of, as well, of course, you have differences because casks have been used for different beverages maybe before, or they have a different age, they have a different type of oak, they have a different size, which even uh, impacts the, t the taste uh, and so on and so forth. Or the, the microflora will also be different if you only use it for young lambic, if you start using it for old lambic. So all influence the taste of, of the lambic uh, once, it, once you actually taste it. It's, it's, and this, of course, makes it fun uh, for a big part. Um, and there's a lot, as I said, there's a lot of science to, to, to making the beer. Um, but for us, science is an art. And of course, as I said, we take samples of the cask, we taste it. We will, we will test the, 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 the lambic in a lab, but then the, the, the science, which is also for us an art, but at the same time will help us make our creations, which is the lambics. And of course, for a big part, it's also just tasting and putting all that together. This is, uh, no, it's not the time, huh? that's the first one. <laughs> Someone said it may be the time. No, this is just to indicate that the cask is full. Oh. If there's no arrow, it's not full, then it needs to be filled because you can't have a fooder that's not full. Uh, this is the brewing season. B is actually uh, quite, a, is already old lamb because this is from three, four, three and a half years ago. Now we're in season uh, uh, F, which is the season today. And then you have the, the numbers here are the, uh, the brew numbers. Personally, for me, it was recently the VAT 86, which is a small cask here. Yep. Fantastic result. It's a very, it's very interesting effect because we have the, the, the cask was actually uh, fixed. So the front and the back uh, sides, the bottoms, as we call it, are new oak, but the mantle around the cask is the old, are still the old states, which contain the microflora. And the first time we fill it, we really get a very interesting 
effect between um, the new oak, which creates, adds, of course, oakiness and bitterness and so on, but the, also the, the microflora, which, which try to uh, which try to mellow it all down, which is very interesting because it's uh, you get you had a very yeah I couldn't uh, kind of uh, describe it uh, um, in any other way. It was just like drinking white wine. You just poured lambic from it. It was just like drinking white wine. Wow. So we said, let's make a monoblend of this. It's it's too good. <laughs> This is the oldest cask, number 79. For as far as we know, at least, that one is built in 1883. How, much, how many times has it been filled, do you think? Uh, let's, say, uh, <laughs> let's say a lot. <laughs> we, use it for, we use it now for a three-year-old Lambic. So it's always now for a three-year-old Lambic, and just like the ones next to it, it's for um, Mariage Parfait. We call it the mono blend because it's 90% of one cask, but 10% young lambic to get refermentation in bottles. So it's a bit of a contra contradictory word, mono blend. Here, of course, there's a, a bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the oval ones are also also a Calvas cask, but these are here since the year 2000. Yeah, five of those big ones, and then. But the ones that we don't see here, if you have some time left, I can actually show you guys the other side maybe, if the door is open. On the other side of the Zenner River, we have a, a, a warehouse with 40 fooders, but those fooders are 240 to 270 hectoliters each. So that's a double the size and the biggest one you just saw over there. Yeah. But that's because we need stock, we need the, the, the space, we need the, uh, the ability to store Lambic. It's like, it's like simple uh, lambic brewery physics. You never have enough space. Currently, this is a good level uh, for us. Um, we could still make a little bit more beer, which would help us to, um, yeah, in a few, for a few things, um, help us just invest in a few more uh, things that we want to upgrade. Things, invest a little bit more in the tourism around the brewery. That's a small thing that we're definitely going to do and keep doing, and that's the project that we're working on right now. But um, no, we, we do want to scale up maybe a little bit, but with what we have. Um, so it's not like we want to scale up for any brew houses are not, uh, not at all relevant right now. Um, but um, with the brew house that we have, we just, if we do just a little bit more, we could uh, eas more easily decide on, okay, we need the new bottling line, which we actually will need in a few years. It will make it easier to decide like this scale of the bottling line. It will help us decide on um, yeah, we're uh, building a warehouse here on the site for bottle aging because we actually have a lot of our bottles that are aging are not aging here in uh, at the brewery. They're at uh, just five minutes from here in another warehouse that we're renting. But you know, if you're renting it, it costs also quite a bit of money. So if you can build it yourself, you actually win back all that money within ten years. So it's all these kind of things that we just still want to do, but it's takes time it takes uh it takes money of course as well so just have to make sure that if we keep going where we're doing today we can do all that and then we're happy so and we'll see in 10 years where <laughs> what else we want to do but it's uh maybe we we have some ideas uh maybe that we're gonna do some things with uh some innovations with lambic but there's it's just still ideas and concepts today but there's Give some of our drinkers a taste of what these innovations uh, will be how far are you willing to go in the Lambic world? Uh, as far as possible, maybe. But for a big, for uh, of course, we always try to just stick within the tradition of Oude Goeze and traditional fr fruited beers. Um, and Oude Goeze, I think it's just always a matter of just improving what we have. And it's all these small, slight percentages of quality. And an example is, for example, just our installation over there that helps us make oxygen free water. That will help us when we're transferring beer from a cask to a tank. If we put that in front of the beer, we will not be touching uh, water that contains oxygen. So again, for us, these kind of things, it's all these small details just to improve uh, the aging and all. Oh, it's 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 a, it's a whole <laughs> it's a whole thing. But yeah, if if if, if really for tastes, um, uh, maybe there's there's a few avenues we can we can uh, follow within uh, fruited lambic beers. There's a thing within the m beer market, perception-wise, definitely in Belgium, which is where we are selling most of our beer, that Krieg is uh, somewhat considered not as a, a very special beer anymore, which is strange, because it's really, it's sherry is fermented with lambic beer, but it's because there's so many var variants of this type of beer. Um, 
that are not made with cherries. It's called f something with fruit, for example. It's red, it's sweet, it's it, and then it's good for a lot of customers. But that's for us. It's been what it's been destroying a little bit the value of what is a real cherry beer. And so there is a few ideas that we have, maybe with some other fruit, but that that we feel like this is what people are going to appreciate. That's somewhat within the same line but that's going to feel like okay this is something special and these are some it's it's without i'm not saying too much but it's within that line that we do have some ideas as well and then perhaps uh combinations with top fermented beers and lambic there's all, all also some some avenues there that have some you know that currently currently have our attention yeah <laughs> but there's still a lot of things concepts and you know there's so much we can still do even just with traditional gurza as well so much we can still do that we haven't done yet uh, so plenty of things to still uh, <laughs> so <laughs> realize yeah definitely 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 <laughs> we're here for the long term <laughs>